Yeah, hey everybody, thanks for coming yeah. out. <laughs> so uh, I was actually gonna begin this speech a little bit with telling you a little bit about myself, which we're gonna kind of go into a little bit here. Um, and then I'll explain a little bit about my background and then we'll go into the pieces that you all see in the gallery and a lot of the concepts uh, came up behind those pieces and what led me to here. So to begin with, um, as she just said, I, a big part of who I am came from my experiences growing up as a pro snowboarder. At a very young age, I was sponsored by my local board shop in Reno, Nevada. And um, by college, I was a professional for a number of snowboard companies. And at this time, I was raised in a very small conservative town. Um, it was actually nicknamed Prison Town USA because of all the four surrounding prisons around it. <laughs> and um, I kind of used this sport as my escape um, and ended up being my ticket out and ticket to photography as well. So I was traveling a lot for snowboarding. Um, you can see here on the left, that's me and one of my best friends. We just packed all of our stuff, like huge bags. We're traveling all around Japan um, filming. Um, but as it goes for many, my youth kind of expired and I had a career ending injury in Canada actually just a couple years back. And at this time, I was based in Lake Tahoe. And this is when I really started to notice a stark change over the years. Um, we were seeing a lot stronger warming cycles, wetter seasons, and increased more dramatic weather cycles, so a change in seasonality. And I remember going from like two or three years without snow to suddenly just getting completely buried, not seeing the sun for <laughs> months. And I think the last year I moved there, I moved out, um, we actually had a tunnel of snow leading to our front door, and some people had like snow up to the second story windows. It was just, we were buried and then it went dry for another three years. So it was, it was, it was kind of a, some big changes and it was really affecting the lake clarity as well if some of you guys have read that in the news. But, um, so it was pretty obvious that climate change was in our basin and I knew I wanted to use my camera to communicate this, but I didn't totally know how at the time. So I was kind of searching and for me living out there, climate change was on the forefront of all of our conversations. Everyone out there had a tie to the natural world but when I moved here, it kind of seemed more of a far away conversation, um, especially in the city. But no matter where I was based, I still had these very primal connections to the environment, especially glaciers. Um, I actually used to live in my truck. Uh, I'd spend summers between Mount Hood Glacier and Lake Tahoe, and some where we'd uh, shower in the lake. And so don't worry, I was clean. <laughs> but everywhere we were, people were aware of what was happening, but they weren't as connected as um, some of the people living in our trucks. <laughs> But and I was kind of wondering why, why this was. And so this leads me to my transition over to my project, Portraits of Ephemerality. So looking at our place in the world, we're all cognizant of our presence on the environment. And with that, if we look at humanity as this force inflicting change on the world, then we have to look at our propensity to bicker and question over our political and ethical responsibilities of the environment. Uh, philosopher Ingla Weeman once said, many of our ecological problems can be traced back to a dichotomy of mind and nature. So if we look back at early civilizations, many of those uh, people had infrastructures and rituals deeply connected to the beauty and significance in nature. But in this developed world, we have kind of detached ourselves from those core values, prioritizing quick economic profit and short-term benefits with the tendency to kind of alienate the scientific community. And as a photographer, what does this mean? How do we approach this? Well, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Elizabeth Colbert once wrote, the most significant change from a geological perspective is one that's invisible to us. The change in the composition of atmosphere. Carbon dioxide emissions are colorless, odorless, and in an immediate sense, harmless. So this brought on a really important question for me. How do you photograph change when that change is invisible? And these are the questions that has informed my approach here. So, Portraits of Ephemerality is a photographic series started with land glaciers in Alaska, where I combine traditional landscape photography with contemporary portrait lighting to isolate the fragile elements of the natural world most immediately impacted by climate change. So in short, I'm looking at the ice as a subject in a studio. Um, and the big question I get with all this is, well, how do you get that light? How do you do this? Is it Photoshop? And no, this is actually just what you see through the viewfinder. Um, and I don't go into detail with all of the pieces because each piece has a different light, uh, light situation. So for this one, um, I actually use a light on the bottom of a drone to give it the hair light, if you will. So that's how you can kind of get it up that high. And then I um, installed two other lights to come from the side to kind of act as the key light, if you will. And 
There's a theory in the photographic world that photography is a fossilization of light and that same fossilization is said to document and illustrate the precariousness of the human habitat. And so I'm trying to suggest a similar framework in this project. Like fossils, these photographs are molds of singular objects in a rapidly changing environment. This is an alternative process though, so it uses light to create an impression of their physical forms more to memorialize them. And now, looking at these photos, um, I purposely obscured the scale and I get asked a lot how tall are these and so right now I'll tell you they're about 70 to 150 feet tall. Um, <laughs> and while bringing into focus the complex forms, the light is bringing the sense of awe and romanticism while pulling it away from the rest of the scene to make these giant structures feel more small and alone. And that is also why I didn't add any human elements to that. I want you to keep pondering over and kind of guessing so you have to look a little closer. And so another thing I get asked a lot about is um, the, uh, the process and the approach. And it's something I'm so incredibly bad at talking about because growing up climbing and snowboarding, um, the approach is just kind of part of the fun, right? But um, <laughs> so for this series, we took out these giant fat bikes and they have these huge studded tires on them and we biked about 14 miles or so um, across this frozen river until we reached the terminus of the glacier where the entire glacial lake had frozen over and locked these giant icebergs in place for the winter. And when we're out here, it, like looking at this, you feel like it should be completely silent, right? We're about 50 miles away from the nearest person or structure, um, but that's far from it. This was, it was very loud, so. In what way? <laughs> so every now and then, we'd hear these loud booms and cracks as oh, the ice oh, would like wow. tumble and shift oh, all yeah, around sure. us. And you think that'd be magical, right? But if you're ah. on this <laughs> glacial lake, uh, very far away from yeah. land, absolutely terrifying <laughs> and so yeah actually one day on the like one of our scouting days I got a little bit brave and I kind of took a wrong turn got a little too close to where I shouldn't have on the on the terminus and all the ground around me just sunk about six inches and have you seen those movies where the main character is just like running away from the breaking ice I felt like that but instead of breaking behind me it was all around me so I was just like all right time to get out. Hopped on the bike and just started going as fast as I could and yeah it was very scary and I knew all right that's an area you can't go over anymore. Um, and so at the same time while the ice was flowing underneath you because we're on the glacial lake with the streams um, and this is a huge um, kind of arctic area the ice underneath has two different flows um, sometimes and they'd meet each other like this and they'd push up ice and then break and I'm going to go back to this one right here and so you can see it right here yeah. and so the two different currents are pushing the ice up and they're thin so they'd push up, break, push up, break so if you were really quiet you could just hear creaking, breaking, creaking, breaking and that was just building up and breaking so it was a very humbling experience to say the least um, and so in other instances, again on this trip, we were out there, we did a couple scout days, wanted to make sure, got all the compositions I, I wanted, I went back, I drew a diagram of how I was going to light everything, but then all of a sudden a big heat wave hit, so they were in Alaska, middle of January, and it all of a sudden is 45, 50 degrees, and it's just totally not safe to be out there at that point, and so yeah, we had to give it some time, wait it out, and by the time we actually had the chance to come back, everything had locked up, but everything had frozen, shifted, um, changed shape, and all this new snow had come on top of it, so it was just a completely new landscape. Um, and this is all kind of to say that, in my experience, these glaciers react to us. Sometimes they're sassy, sometimes they're nice, sometimes I say, get out. <laughs> um, and with that, I actually want to pause and tell a quick story. So this is a piece not shown in this gallery right now, um, but this is of Kennecott Glacier. And it's the most recent photo added to the series, and it feels much more different. I purposely added this kind of softer studio light, because I think it tells more of a story in this instance. And this glacier is a rock-covered glacier, a debris-covered glacier, if you will. So looking at this, the entire rock field actually just sits on top of that ice. So you can walk on top of it, but the ground is very unstable. <clears throat> and so with this one, I actually had the opportunity to go out and do some field work with glaciologists. And what I learned was the these large rocks that you see, see this big old boulder right here, this one right here, are actually acting as insulators to the ice. They kind of keep it protected from all the, um, the rising temperatures on the outside. 
But the smaller, more like the dirt right here, the smaller pebbles um, do the opposite. It actually increases the melt rate. And so when this happens, we get a very steep part of the glacier. Um, the rocks can't, the big rocks can't stay on it, and so then it increases the melt rate to the side, and you get this reverse type rider type melting, and then these uh, rivers kind of run through, act as plumbing. <clears throat> and so um, to access this glacier, I, we all went out as a big group. We had to pop over this little um, stream and popped over at probably like eight in the morning, totally safe. And we were out there doing our, our readings, our work, and about six hours later, I like to say. Um, the sun had been baking on it all day, and all of a sudden it was low 80s, high 70s, and it was just hot. And so <laughs> um, we go to exit the same place we got on, and that little tiny stream was now this just giant rushing river, and it was like, oh, yep, not safe to go that over here. And this is when one of the glaciologists said, um, oh, she's being sassy today. And I was like, it's hot, of course. <laughs> and so then we had to march down the river to kind of find our exit point. And, it was about, I think, two miles or so of walking, which, you know, walking two miles is not that bad, but walking two miles on this was a whole other breed because it started to go from, like, small little hills to these really, really steep caverns and just having to climb back up. And we eventually ended up finding this um, ice bridge over the, the now river, and it was about 35 feet thick and 300 feet off the ground and 10 feet wide. It was very precarious. They marched over it no problem, and I was like, yeah, sure, this is safe, and so it was a little bit scary. Um, but when we got back, the glaciologist showed me a time lapse they took of um, this glacier, and I'm going to show a wide angle as well. Um, and so he set his camera up uh, somewhere along these pebbles and let it go for a month. And he showed me what that looks like sped up, and it, just the ground goes up and down and up and down, just like it's breathing. And what's actually happening is the water is pushing the ice up and down, and up and down as um, the temperature gets hotter and it needs more flow. But it really just felt like it was breathing. It all felt alive, yeah. And so something that really stuck with me here was as I was talking with him, he started to say, call this the ugly glacier. And to me, I was like, what, this is not ugly? He's like, well, referring to the other pieces you see in the gallery, the nice pristine blue ones with the white, he said, as the land glaciers, this isn't everywhere, but as the land glaciers start to melt and disappear, more and more of them are going to start looking like this so-and-so um, ugly glacier. And uh, that really stuck with me throughout this whole process, and I started to like, want to come back and visit these more. And I want to come back to this guy right here. And so starting to set these stories aside, I want to refer to our earlier question. How do you show something that we can't see? Well, glaciers have become the premier tool to talk about climate change. Media outlets often publish glacier photos in tandem with photos of extreme storms, given perspective through these very fear-inducing headlines. So when this imagery gets so ingrained into an ideology, it's impossible to escape their reference. And I'm offering a new framework for this kind of representation. I want to acknowledge the instability and implications of the human-caused destruction imposed on these places through this presentation of a complicated web of emotion. So there's this push and pull between the relatable and unrelatable that challenges the framework of traditional landscape photography and offers an invitation to kind of reinterpret the glacier not as just one receding unit. And we're supposed to um, be focused on one aspect of a broader system. And because when we think about landscape, we think about this untamed vastness, that Western perception that landscape is to reinforce entitlement, ownership through an expression of grandeur. And I try to make these uh, immense foreign scenes feel very intimate and close, especially with just this, a spotlight putting it on a stage. Mm. Now, by putting these vanishing ecosystems on a stage, it could be kind of argued that by reducing tragedy to an aesthetically pleasing photograph, um, but I'm aware of the delicate line this work plays into. And psychologists have found that promoting positive engagement through visual representation over fear-inducing images are far more effective in motivating genuine personal engagement. And so there's plenty of polarizing images of the disappearing Arctic, and has been found those photos are more likely to distance or disengage an audience, making them feel helpless, overwhelmed when it comes to such a big concept. And so rather, I'm choosing to establish that human connection to these remote areas by photographing them as human portraits. 
And just like photographing a human in the grand scheme of time, these places change in the next instant. And by putting these areas in immediate danger of the climate crisis on a stage, I'm trying to feel that awe and wonder to look deeper, to be curious. And so as we're kind of wrapping this up, I consider myself a documentarian photographer, uh, a documentarian photographer that uses very alternative practices. So while I use light to manipulate the scene, it still remains true to what's created through the viewfinder. And this work resonates deeply with the key concepts of the Dusseldorf School of Photography. When I approach these photos, I intentionally draw out how I can cut back the extraneous information to find the essence of the scene. And in doing that, I'm making that sense of scale feel very impossible to find. And they almost become miniatures to study. And so I found a lot of inspiration through the Beckers and the way they kind of view their architectural structures as photographic heirs to the ready-made. And so the Beckers um, are up here. They did large-scale photographs of industrial structures, considering them found objects. And they always they have this impeccable eye for geometry as well. They brought in a lot of um, ladders to kind of shoot straight on. And that's why all their photos are straight, and they were great to study. Um, but like the so also with the Beckers, they only shot on cloudy days to kind of reduce shadows and control the lighting. And so like the Beckers only shooting on cloudy days, I found inspiration to control the shadows, but I'm controlling the shadows through lighting and um, new technology. And so for me, these glaciers are found architectural structures, only they're found in the natural environment. And so as I wrap this up, um, for me, this work comes in correspondence with the destruction of the environmental protections and ongoing climate fight. It's, almost, uh, it's mo more important than ever to implement the climate policy now, which we have just seen is absolutely not happening. Uh, a photographer will never tell the entire, or a photograph, sorry, will never tell the entire story because it's an implied truth. It tells the perceived story through the eye of the creator. So if I can't photograph an invisible change, then I can use technology of light and the camera to communicate stories and complex concepts into a simple manner. I can play into human emotions, memories, increase awareness, and influence personal opinion. And so I see this as not my job to soften the edges of climate change, but to just think more critically about it. These photos are meant to be a political examination to pull the viewer in while accentuating the socioeconomic issues tied to glacier ice. And I'm trying to influence more critical thought by putting these systems on a stage and depict the complex, complex ecosystems as more of that living entity that I've just told you about, and just as I've come to see them. So thank you all very much for coming and listening to me. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I'll bring up Comments. one of my favorite pieces. Yeah. So um, I love I love the use of the uh, drone light and the side lights, and I think it's just so amazing and cool. And then just like you were talking about the Beckers at the time of day, mm -hmm. the next, where they were shooting, I was I'm assuming you're not wandering around the glaciers at night. So <laughs> are you controlling the light that comes in the camera and then shooting the um, having the lights go off, like strobe lights? Yeah, well, I'm totally exploring it at night. I mean, like... This is really at night? Yeah, well... Oh, my gosh. I mean, in Alaska, the night is all the time in the winter, so this is, like, four in oh. the afternoon. Oh. But, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's still... It's uh, it the... <laughs> yeah, so, we like, we go out a couple times during the day to, like, okay, this is our route. It's we know how to light. get there, yeah. It's still light. And so then we go back, we drop the diagram, like, I want to light it like this. I'm going to set my camera here. So we have our plan, and then we go back when it's completely dark oh, so we can be like, this is what we want. Yeah. How do you uh, how do you get do you got, have guides that take you there? Uh, where, where, where are the restraints? Yeah, there's it's the restraints come more from like having to have a static camera, so I can't be on a boat. I can't. I have to be able to like explore and be there at night, and that's always really tough. But I did have a guide. Actually, guide. Um, it was just a friend of a friend. Um, I have a lot of friends that. Um, guide heli skiing in Alaska from my snowboard days and so they took me out and then once you started there I got in contact with some people in the University of Alaska and they were really excited about it and so yeah any other questions for me do you camp out on these glaciers like how many days are you out when you do this I wish we could have camped out on this one the weather was a little bit iffy the entire time so we're like I don't know because every night there was a kind of a good sized snowstorm that we're like, we don't totally want to get caught in this. If anything goes sideways, we can't have anyone rescue us. 
Um, so not really. The other one that I showed, I did camp very close to it. Um, but this one, we just kind of went in and out every day and was Is pretty close to it. Is mile? Yeah, bike entry. ride. Yeah. And then, so like, we can imagine, you know, fat tire with studs. Yeah. But like, how are you getting your gear? Not, is it on your back? Are you pulling pulse with these bikes? Totally just a big old backpack. <laughs> and a friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a very good friend. <laughs> a stalker. Yeah, there you go. Where else have these images been shown so far? This, this body of work? Um, we've had uh, some shows in China, Indonesia, um, nice. some in Manhattan. Yeah, around there, yeah. Mm. Oh, and Vermont as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so your photos are illustrating and reporting climate change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I see are softened edges on these uh, pieces of ice and glacier, right? rather than sharp and uh, very hard edges like the mountain range and like that, where I imagine they rock, the ice would be. But these are like you know, very softened. Is that the message? Is that what we're is that what you're illustrating in your photos? I am trying to um, kind of make, make it simpler. Quality? So yeah, I guess I've never gotten the softened edges part because to me I'm like, oh, sharp edge, but that is is absolutely correct. But it's all like melting, like softened, like yes. when ice melts. Yes, and that also came from the day before it melted. But yeah, um, also those big mountain glaciers, it's a little harder to do this project up there because of the constraints of trying to camp up there in the middle of the night. Uh -huh. So this, that's why this one's very specific to land glaciers. But yes, I am trying to kind of find those softer lines and um, kind of what I found was beautiful. Like we saw this uh, piece uh, from the ridge and we're like, that's our first shot right there. We're just like, that is just gorgeous. We love how the, like, the lines work like this. There's a good, th I just, like when it looks beautiful to me, I'm like, I, I, that's something I want to show. <laughs> it's just different stages of climate change is climate change is imposing this on the glacier. Mm -hmm. A little uh, bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. The whole concept of breathing, the whole concept of the movement and the change and the back and forth is fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was it was really stark when I first found that out. I was like, oh my gosh, this is actually like reacting to us. <laughs> so do you feel that you have um, received any kind of positive response to this? What, what kind of um, people or jur journalists have written about some of your work to say that the, you know, the message is getting through? Uh, it's it's a, definitely a mixed bag because some people look at it and they're just like oh, gorgeous, and then they get wrapped up in like the technology behind it of like how do you do that? And a lot of times yeah, I'm like oh I think they just want to try it for themselves, which is totally cool. Like I don't own the patent on this. I did not create drone lighting, um, but the, some people have really accepted the miniatures in a studio idea. They really like that line where they um, kind of just study it more. Um, and it's kind of such a new idea. There's only one other person that I can think of that is actively pushing drone lighting as much as it is now. Um, and so everyone's just more caught up in the cons or the technology. And so like this is the first time I've been able to really speak about the concept. Is only uh, to a couple of people so far. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. What, Thank you. Um, what's the next project that you're working on? I mean, living in Brooklyn, I'm sure you're not seeing a lot of ice. So. Yeah. <laughs> Especially now. <laughs> Uh, there's a couple uh, ideas. I was supposed to go to Chile in October, but unfortunately that did not ha uh, pan out as I wanted to do. Uh, I'm trying to kind of gear up and practice some ice climbing the earlier um, earlier winter and kind of see where that takes me. I have some ideas, but I don't want to say it in case it doesn't happen and everyone gets disappointed. But um, definitely still going up north. I don't have any plans to go south in Antarctic like you've seen the other I places. Last year in Antarctica. It's amazing. <laughs> I'd love to. I also really want to climb some of those peaks because apparently we can rock climb a lot of those places now. <laughs> yeah. Could you speak about this particular That's not mine. That's uh, John Paul's behind you. He'll speak that one. <laughs> can I ask you about scale? Sure. So this kind of, um, this is like a materials artist question. So you're a photographer and so you, your work can exist sort of in a virtual sense. We can see it on our computer screen. We can mm -hmm. see it 
you know, or, or we could see it in print. And so my question is, when it's in print, what is your ideal scale? Great question. <laughs> I love to see them huge because I shoot with a medium format, um, 100 megapixel camera, to specifically get as much detail as I can out of each little piece. And because of that, um, actually with this one, um, you can um, sometime if you guys ever want to see it, um, there's little these tiny little droplets and that's the only thing that gives it scale, but it really also shows um, action and tells a story with that. And so I love to see them big, but also with this one, I like to see this one small because that one specifically is really big, but it also kind of gives you that like juxtaposition of between small and large with that. In your transition from snowboarding to photography, environmental photography, climate change photography, did you go through sponsorship withdrawal? Uh, with, I uh, actually the exact opposite. <laughs> um, when I quit snowboarding to start photography, I wasn't totally supported by the companies. They were like they kind of just like left me by the wayside. And then when I started doing this drone lighting, I actually tested it out on a snowboarder first. Um, and got picked up by a couple places and the company that I used to ride for um, hired my old roommate to do that because he lived with me and knew how to do it. <laughs> so they like totally stole the concept. I got a call from him a couple months ago. He's like, dude, how do you do this? I'm stuck here. I couldn't figure out how you do this. I'm like, why'd you take the job, man? <laughs> but so yeah, exact opposite. <laughs> this was all um, saving up and just trying to figure it out on my own because no one really... Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> But yeah, no one really understood the concept when I first pitched it. They're like, there's no way you could do that. Because I've been trying to do this since my undergrad when I lived in Tahoe, and I finally had to just like, fund it myself. Well, talk about the immediacy of the importance of the, importance of the immediacy. How many of these exist? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I can't give you an exact number on that. Um, but I can tell you that I can tell you the melt rate that a lot of them are in, um, in Alaska are disappearing. So at first it was seven percent, then it was twelve percent, and now I can't get a straight answer because they haven't decided yet. Um, but twelve percent faster than pretty much everything else in the world. But you would like something that I found really interesting. While you're there, everyone kind of sees these things as permanent, um, just parts they of the world. Granted. Yeah, they take it for granted, yeah. mm -hmm. and they're just like, oh, we can go out here whenever. Yeah. And only once it reaches past a certain point of like, oh, it is so much farther away than when it was like when I was a kid, do they realize, oh, it's leaving and it's leaving fast. And so. so would video be a better yeah, medium? Like you described that one time lapse photography time was, lapse. Um, time that lapse. was done for scientific purposes, right? Mm -hmm. But like I also saw somewhere on the internet, like they have satellite images of a particular riverbed but like over 10 years, mm -hmm. and then you watch the river just snake back and forth, like, like a serpent, like rippling across the, mm -hmm. the valley of the floor. And so I wonder, are there time-based things that can be a part of your work? For me, um, I like to keep it very still and quiet like this because I think when you see these things happen over a long period of time, happen so quick, that's when you start to get that panic that um, worry that everything gets like a little bit too much and you have to take a break when this we can kind of enjoy it but we still have this conversation because we've been looking at these so it's still in behind it and I don't have to be the one to make you sad <laughs> um, as in like the maybe like the UN yeah there or someplace like that on a smaller scale or more local scale I would love to I've been um, kind of just presenting I've been talking to some people at the Sierra Club a little bit about it um, okay. Yeah, and so I, lo I, I just love to talk about it as much as I can to kind of get it out. I also took a really big break after school because um, I needed to just like breathe for a second. And so this is, I've just recently gotten back into it and I've been talking with some, um, I forgot the college, but it's uh, up north a little bit, talking with them about doing some projects. And I've been talking with some people in Alaska about doing some speeches and this has been presented in some conferences over in Juneau with um, trying to get glaciologists more on board with having artists come along with their projects. Yeah. Um, in 2017, I was fortunate to visit the Burrito Moreno Glacier in Patagonia. Yeah. And at that time, it was the only glacier that was actually increasing. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you knew the status of that now in 2020. 
don't know that specific one, but I do know that there are some glaciers in Patagonia that are increasing, but also a lot of them are receding because of that. And it kind of just goes in yeah, different patterns. So some of them are still increasing, but it's not like a, a sustainable rate of like, this is going to keep doing it. Um, and you, it, there's some kinds of ice that are not getting made anymore because of that, because they can't freeze for a long enough time. Thank you very yeah, much. thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.